well, a much clearer day, Andy. Mm -hmm. uh, Very pretty. We look out of the Grey Lounge to the capital city, and those pictures we've just shared with you, I think still as stunning as they were day one when we sat here, keys and grey, Actually, unplugged. I'd, 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 I'd stretch it a bit. They're as stunning as they were the first time I saw that view nearly eight years ago. Yes, that's true. And the reason <laughs> that we're showing you the view is viewer feedback. People have been asking, where's the view gone? Why aren't you on the balcony? The answer, as I've said a couple of times, it's now just getting a little bit too, too warm hot. to spend time on the balcony. <laughs> uh, as regards the other housekeeping notes, uh, have you spotted the difference yet? Continually there is change, mm. although it's not necessarily very obvious. No, subtle change. Subtle changes. To the scene. To the scenery. Newspapers, Andrew? Yes, please. The morning after? Yes. Uh, it's Restart Rebellion report the Daily Mail. Two thirds of clubs will now oppose neutral venues. Uh -huh. Premier League insists teams will be relegated if the season is curtailed. One of the reasons, of course, I should have thought about it, that, that teams don't want to play in neutral stadiums is stadium sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And Spurs are amongst 12 who have raised their hands and said, uh, we're not happy. So the rebels have had some support now? Well, I don't like to call them rebels. <laughs> no, I everybody like to, else has been no, called I like to rebels. talk about those with a different view yes. to that which the Daily Mail has told us we have to have, <laughs> which is always uh, the case. Yeah. Um, Danny Rose, not best pleased that he's been asked to play football. Um, the headline you can read for yourself and the contents. It mm -hmm. is fairly explicit. Um, this is interesting. I said yesterday I expect the uh, Premier League to capitulate and wave through the Saudi takeover of Newcastle, but new evidence in relation to allegations of broadcast piracy in Saudi Arabia was presented to the Premier League yesterday. Okay. Fresh legal documents have been submitted, which are now being poured over, so further delay, and it might yet be that there is a decision that, that I, I would give the Premier League great credit for making, but I expect they probably won't. Mm. Uh, Daily Mirror, ground force, same story as the back page of the Daily Mail. Uh, amongst the other things yesterday that were decided at the 20 club Zoom uh, get together were that the mini transfer window gets the go ahead. Now, this is all very well for Premier League clubs to say, we're going to extend contracts beyond June the 30th. I repeat what I've said to you many times, mm -hmm. you're not extending mine if I know I'm <laughs> leaving a club for another because I am not playing on and endangering my career, well-being and family mm -hmm for the sake of four weeks of nonsense. I'm sorry, I've got a hammy. Have you? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would be playing. So I know that's you probably I know you why would. they'd well, sign me ahead of you. Well, well, they wouldn't because yeah, you, would. you'd be on your back for the next six months, no, recovering from injury, no and chance. nobody's paying you. I would no be at chance. my new club enjoying no life. No chance. You would be well insured, not a problem. Richard, but you're not. You would be. Richard Masters, um, restart or we'll end the Prem now. Well, well, that's, that's uh, what we've said. I, that, that's the only two can, things can you can, can do, a restart or end it. Can I just point out once again that Richard Masters works for the Premier League. In other words, the 20 shareholders. He will do as he's told by the 20 shareholders, not what he wants them to do. It doesn't work like that. Listen, it's a, it doesn't matter what Richard Masters, and, and, and it honestly doesn't matter what the Premier League wants. At the end of the day, if two, two sections of people say no. If the government say no football... They won't. They're if, desperate. Right? If they said no football, it's got nothing to do with the Premier League. And more importantly, of the... Well, what did I see yesterday? 25 teams, 25 players per squad, 20 teams, 500 players. Yep. If a large amount of 500 Premier League players say we don't want to play, the league won't start again. No. If it doesn't start, points per game, Bournemouth go down. If it doesn't start weighted home and away, West Ham, West Ham go down. Go down and and it's those two clubs that yeah. are adversely affected at yeah. the bottom. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Uh, Pep Guardiola is a target for a Barcelona return. Juan Laporta, Saw that. Uh, who former president of Barcelona, is mm -hmm. running to take the presidency once again and has said we want him to come back. Uh, he knows as well as we know, not while Messi's there. Mm -hmm. No chance. No? No chance. Uh, indefinite crowd ban leaves sports in fear for the future. Well, yeah. we, we know that. We know that. UEFA are determined to stick with their plans for a nation league when football returns. <laughs> um, now, this will interest you. Uh, amateurs on the pitch infection risk lower than for the elite. Uh, let me see if my phone will behave and turn sideways. Thank you. Yes, it has. So this is a study that says the risk of spreading coronavirus during a match is considerably lower for amateurs than it is for elite footballers, according to research that's been carried out, because amateurs generally play shorter matches than professionals and within a distance of 1.5 metres of each other for a total of only 60 seconds per hour of football. Whereas uh, if you're a professional footballer, 
it rises 67. to 60, yeah. 67 yeah. seconds. So Juan, uh, Javier Tabas, the yeah. La Liga president, has said, well, there's no risk. Well, it's not that we're talking about the virus being spread on the pitch, Mr. Tabas. It's everything else that goes with it, for goodness sake. <sighs> you, I'm not arguing with this one. No. Players without deals about that. for next season are left in limbo. And this one to close with Anthony Boy. Fauci, the US uh, infectious diseases expert, has cast doubt on the NFL season starting, starting in September. Well, that's it's different. Listen, every, Why is it con- different? Well, every country will be in a different stage of how they're dealt with the coronavirus. You can go play football in New Zealand if you want to. The two basket cases in the world right now are the US and the UK. The US worse than anyone. Mm. And fairness, they're worse than anybody. So, and it's such a big country. And the East is different from the West and the Midwest and the Mideast. And the centre of America is pretty much, they're trying to do what they want. But the East Coast and the West Coast of America are absolutely epicentres. Let's introduce you to our guest this morning. Um, He's well-travelled as well. Very well-travelled. We may have a view on many of these things. Yes. uh, Linguist, par excellence. How many languages do you think? Go on, let's have a guess. Uh, uh, Five. I'm going, I'm going six, maybe. Okay, I'm, I think I'm, you might I'm, have learned I'm more one. comfortable with your answer. I think it might be uh, six. He is the father of the Premier League mm-hmm. these days, and uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted. I'd like to consider myself friend. Yes. I'd like to think he does yes. consider us to be so, Andy. I hope it so. is the former England manager, the current manager of Crystal Palace, Mr. Roy Hodgson. Roy, how are you? Hi, Roy. Hello, Richard. Hello, Andy. I'm very well, thank you. How many languages do you speak? Basically one these days. I think <laughs> they've faded into the past, but uh, I get a chance sometimes to catch up on my Swedish by watching some of the Swedish drama programs in the original language with subtitles. Yeah. So that, that language still survives, but the others, I'm afraid, are fading. How apart. many was it, Roy, at its peak? How many could you fluently talk in your peak? Well, I don't think I've ever been able to speak more than three, really, for oh, all those wow. during my two and a half years in Italy, of course. So yeah. I've had to count in Italy, Italian amongst my fluent languages then. And during the time with Switzerland, I suppose my German wasn't so bad. But, I mean, uh, I would be... Uh, I would be hard put to have a real conversation in German today, especially <laughs> if it was anything to do with uh, other than football. Yeah. <laughs> when we're talking about abroad, can I just ask, Roy? Of course. When we're talking about abroad, Roy, and you have coached, as we've talked about it, in many countries and, and, and experienced many cultures in your coaching career, as, the, as Richard said, the father of the Football League, so to speak, in coaching terms, is it an advantage or would it be an advantage in your eyes now for English coaches, if we're trying to make them better, to do what you did and travel beyond mm. the, per- the perimeters of the UK and learn about other cultures of football? Well, I think it's a great life experience. And I think there are a lot of English coaches who are, are bright enough and adventurous enough to realise that too. That it wouldn't just be a case of being able to pursue their careers and become better uh-huh. football coaches. I think they probably see it as well as an opportunity to learn something new in their lives, to... to get their brains working on something (laughs) other than football, i.e. learning a language and uh, assimilating a culture. So I would definitely recommend it to Mm. anyone who was offered a good job and wanted to take that job. But of course, in England, the the top coaches are in the top leagues, Mm -hmm. they're in the top money. So it's going to be very hard for anything other than the very top top clubs in Europe to attract them. Mm. So you're really talking about a a different section, if you like, of coaches who would be interested in that. And... In my case, it was really a question of not making a choice between staying and coaching in England or coaching abroad. I didn't have any opportunities to coach in England, but I, I got one to coach abroad. So uh, the choice was a very simple one. Do Correct me don't. if I'm wrong, Roy. What, was it not Malmo? Were, were you, were you yes. on the bench with Bobby Houghton that night when Forrest played them in the European Cup final? No. Um, I came to Sweden thanks to Bob Houghton. Bob Houghton came to Sweden in 1974 was a very young young man. I think he was only 26 at the time and coached Malmö. And uh, for two years, he was there very successfully. He won the league first year and did the double in the second year. Because, you know, it's a year-long football there. Yeah. It's not a season. It's a, yeah. The season starts in March and finishes in early December. So um, he was the one who recommended me in 1976 to another club called Harmstead. And I was there for five years. So 
I actually went to the cup final as a guest of uh, Malmers, but I wasn't working there. Bob was working there. And uh, I joined Bob for the first time at Bristol City in 1980 when Bob came to Bristol City and I joined him as assistant manager there. So the reason for the question was, I was trying to get a date, 1974 to 2020. 72, still going, why? Well, I, I didn't start in 1976, so you give me two ah, years extra. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I'll yeah, take two off it. I'll take two off it. I think it's partly because of my love of the game, of course, and my, my enjoyment that I get from the, the day-to-day work with the players. And I even miss that on occasions when I was working with national teams, although it's been good to have done both. Um, so I think that's the main uh, focal point for me, to get up in the morning and have that training session to look forward to, the interaction with the players and the other members of staff. And then come Saturdays, you've always got something to look mm. forward to in the way of a game, even though sometimes the games cause you a lot of heartache but they don't go the way you want them to go. But, it, you know, when you, you know, the cliches in football, you know as well as I do, the, you know, the, the Mondays, the Fridays are great and then the Saturdays spoil it because you've got to play and <laughs> possibly get beat. But it, it is a real cliche because the truth is that when you haven't got that Saturday to look forward to, uh, you miss it enormously and that's been brought home, I would think, to many, many people now in these last two months mm. since football stopped here. Mm. Right, how, what's the longest you've been without employment? What's the longest you've gone in those 44 years? Just under a year, I suppose, when I left England and then before joining Crystal Palace. But I did do some, some work in that time. I, I was invited by Man City to go and spend a bit of time with their, mm -hmm. their club in Melbourne. Uh, so I had one or two little spells of doing things. But in terms of really working mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, that, that year is really the only time I've been out of work for any, any period of time. I ask you that, Roy, because I, I hear these days, we, we talk about the modern day manager, you, you've talked about you think Klopp will take a break yes. soon. We talk about Klopp will take a break. We see, we saw Pep Guardiola leave uh, Barca and take a, or no, Bayern Munich and take a year out. But, so Barca and left. Certainly yeah. took a year out. Has the game changed that much now that if, you, if you're young like those two guys, that there is a chance of burnout more now than there was when you started? Well, I think the major difference, Andy, is the fact that I started and did so many years at a, a quite a different level of competition mm -hmm. and quite a different level of stress and pressure and public attention. Um, you know, 20 years for those guys, really, would certainly equate quite easy with my 45 <laughs> because a lot of the time I've been working out of that enormous spotlight that comes right. when you're with one of the top clubs or working in a top league like the Spanish League, the German League or the English League. Um, it's still football, it's still senior football, it still matters to a lot of people, even though there might not be 70,000 people watching the games, mm -hmm. it is still a very vital and viable way of earning your living and you know, you're coaching and managing in the same way as you would be at a higher level. But the difference, of course, is you're not under that enormous scrutiny, yeah. that enormous pressure. And I think that's what burns people out. And um, it's not easy. I mean, a lot of young coaches actually ask me about the situation, you know, when they're quite young themselves and they're looking at a, a long, long period ahead of them if they're going to, you know, work even into their 60s, let alone mm -hmm. their 70s. Yeah. But I always try to say to them that, you know, you've really got to try if you enjoy it that much to keep going yeah. as long as you can because the one thing that is going to be 100% certain that when you stop, you miss it. And oh, I'm yeah. pretty certain that, you know, if someone said to you today, do you miss your playing days? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm convinced your answer will be yes, I do oh, miss my playing right. days. But there comes a time when you can't play at that level any longer, and that's the time you have to stop. The same might apply with coaches too. But luckily, I haven't burned out. Uh, and I think, to some extent, I've been helped by the, the transition between club football and, and, and national team yeah. football, because that does give you in, a different perspective, mm -hmm. and it also gives you a different rhythm of life when you're with national teams. But is it more full on, Roy? I, I, I mean, you're probably like us. You're, you're hunting around every night for something to watch. I happened to cross some gold last night on YouTube, an early uh, programme uh, of, of mine, which I found fascinating. Um, oh, I turned it off. <laughs> I turned it off, Roy, right away when I saw it was Keezy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I also happened to cross a behind the scenes at Manchester United in 1989, Fergie and Archie Knox. Yes. And they were planning for an upcoming game. It was just Fergie and Archie in the office at the Cliff, the old training HQ for Manchester United. 
and they were discussing that, well, they've got two up front. They don't sort of run on, they come close. So there'll be plenty of space for our defenders to step out. And, <laughs> and, and this, this was the pre-match planning. Two guys sat in an office with a cup of tea. Is it still like that or has it changed dramatically? Oh, it has changed dramatically. I mean, I think one of the major changes is the amount of help we get from staff now. You know, staffs in those days were the sort of level of staff you, you talked about. I've got a feeling I might have seen the same, same clip myself. And, you know, you, you, today, if you like, the staff outside of the actual technical staff is as big almost as a squad <laughs> yes. of players. And, yes. you know, the conditioning trainers. It wasn't that long ago that we didn't have you know, full-time conditioning trainers. No. You know, that really, you'd have to go back probably to about the mid to late 90s before they appeared at all. Full-time goalkeeper coaches at that time. So let alone the, the enormous amount of physios and masters and doctors, but also, of course, the analysts. They're, they're, they're the ones, I think, who made the major difference. Is because it becoming... Fair, in the past, you, you send your scouts to games, yeah. you got your scouting reports, which you read, you, you maybe spoke to them and they... They did exactly what you said. Well, watch out for this one, and this is the sort of system they play. Yeah. But really, you were, you didn't have that detailed information that we have today, where every game is analysed to the nth degree. We can really pick out the pieces which we think are valid and 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 most important to us with regard to the way we play it and the way we can play with the players that we have. And I think that's an enormous difference. And you know, I think if anything, you'll see further improvements there and uh, there'll be no going back I'm afraid, uh, that's I'm afraid I suppose I'm nostalgic to some extent for those days too, <laughs> where you did sit around with a cup of tea with your staff and discuss what you thought the other team were going to do but you know, we've moved so far forward professionally that I won't see those days again I was, I was, You've answered what I was going to say how you, I was going to ask you, do you think it's becoming too analytical, that we're, we're, we're taking too much time because it's, it's a sport certainly for me with with human error in it when you go and play, which is not regimented because you don't know what a player's going to do with the football many times. And it just happens, a lot of things happen on a football pitch off the cuff, as you say. But it seems to me more and more, Roy, we're becoming more regimented in how we watch teams play and how guys analyse the game and how they set their team up. Is that the case? Yeah, I think so. I'm sure, like, like myself, you're, you're following avidly the the Michael Jordan documentary, <laughs> The Last mm -hmm. Dance, which is you know quite incredible in terms of an insight into yeah. a, a top basketball team, and a lot of the work they're doing out there is you know 15 to 20 years old, and you know, the amount of detail and information they're given to play their basketball games. I don't think we'll ever move back from it. I don't think we should. No. I think it's a question of how you use it. We find it very useful for both pre and post match. You know the the pre-match to try and get together what we think are going to be the major weapons that the opposing team have and any weaknesses that we might be able to spot where mm. we think our play might be able to cause them some problems. But it's equally as important to analyse our own games. Yeah. And it's an extra coaching tool because the bottom line is this, that there's only a certain amount of actual physical work you can do on the pitch each week. You know, people who have not been involved in football seem to think it's an easy life to be a footballer, you know, an hour a day or an hour and a half a day. <laughs> but of course, that's because we're preparing for performance. And we, we can't leave the performance on the training floor. No. The, the performance has got to be when the, when the day comes when you're required to perform, which is once or maximum twice a week. So having these opportunities to go through work that the players need to know about and need to do, if you like, and tactical uh, advice they need to be able to get into their heads. To have the extra advantage of being able to do this with a, with a video, it just helps you because you can't really do it all on the pitch because strangely mm. enough, there isn't enough time. Yeah. Right, well, never mind Michael Jordan, I'm so desperate. I'm, I'm currently watching Great Railway Steam Journeys of the UK. Yeah, well, there's, some people are sadder than others, Roy, at this particular moment in time. I quite like them. Like them. <laughs> there you go. Well, Thank you very you much. Well. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, let's get it right up to date. <laughs> let's get it right up to date. Um, like Andy and myself, uh, you're of a certain age, we, we, we are in the high-risk category, thus we're being very careful. Uh, you, you're 72 now. Uh, two questions. One, are you going on? Are you going to sign another deal at Palace? I have done, yes. You have done. That's already done. Excellent. Okay, and when, when and if the Premier League goes back to work, 
Are you going to be able to? Yes. No concerns at all about age? No, I think age is age, isn't it? I mean, it's how you feel, really. I mean, your age doesn't necessarily relate to your fitness or how you're feeling or, or your capacity to do a job. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I feel every bit as good as I did on March the 10th. In fact, probably a little bit better because this time has given me more chance even to work on my fitness than I had during the time I was working on a daily basis. So you're you're like no Andy Roy. Whatsoever. And when I'm called back to work, I should be very happy to go back to work. You're, you're just like Andy. No, nothing, nothing affects him adversely. Well, no, I don't. But, well, but, I, I don't. What, what, about, what about staff? What about if some of your players say, I'm scared, I'm not coming in? Well, this is going to be a matter, of course, for the individual. And it's a matter for the club. At the end of the day, I shall abide by whatever the club rules in, in, in that respect. I would be very surprised, knowing my club as I do, and knowing the chairman, Steve Parrish, as I do, that he would not be sympathetic to a player who actually came and said, look, I have serious mm -hmm. reservations about playing. I'm certain he would solve that situation. But it would be taken out of my hands anyway, and I certainly wouldn't have any problems with it whatsoever. Um, you know, we, we're trying, to some extent, in an attempt to get football back, you know, on the table again, really. And, and uh, we've got the green light from the government to go back to work, i.e. As, as a population. And the Premier League's doing its level best with its stakeholders, shareholders, not just the teams itself, but the broadcasting partners, to try and reach a solution that would enable it to be, to be played again. But the fact is, it's, it's never going to be an ideal situation. We're no. never going to go back to March the 10th. No. Whatever, whatever happens and however football, re or however football is, is able to reappear, it will be in a lot of different ways yes. and there will be compromises to, to Absolutely. deal with, I suppose. And one of those compromises might mean that one or two players in your squad might not, long, might mm -hmm. not be there in the beginning because they've decided they, they don't feel comfortable with playing. Sure. March the 10th, you keep saying, and I, I'm, I'm March the 10th, it seems an age ago, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It uh, does, does seem an age ago. It's an age ago, you, it's nine then, weeks. Then you remember why we stopped, and that is because Mikel Arteta was, was, mm. was positive uh, for carrying coronavirus. Uh, and since then, nothing. Can I, let's talk about dates. What were you doing 10 years ago this month? What were I doing? 10 years, years ago like? this month. What was happening in your years? life? How many years ago, Andy? I didn't hear Ten. That. Ten? Ten, ten years, Roy, yeah. Ten years ago this month. Ten years ago. Ten years ago, so what's that? Come on, come be on. Be careful. That's a clue, be careful. 2010. Oh, that was, that was at Fulham, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. come on. Good man. See, I just, thought you'd know that right away. Just my second European Cup final. Yes. Correct. <laughs> both, both, both after extra time, one on penalty. I was going to say, do you remember it well, but obviously not. <laughs> I had to get the date first. I had to, I had to, my, my arithmetic's worse than my memory. I had to get, uh, subtract 10 from 20. Yeah, great club, great times, Roy. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm delighted. I didn't, I didn't notice you'd re-sign. Delighted you have. Yeah, absolutely. Just Congratulations, going. Roy. Do, do, I mean, do you have any plans if you set yourself a target or are you just happy to keep going as long as you're able? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm aware. You know, you have to be aware of, of your, your powers and, and, and the qualities that you bring. At the moment, I don't think that's diminished particularly over the last years. And my enthusiasm, my energy, my desire, all of those things still exist. And Good. I think while that happens, I don't need to contemplate no. uh, retiring in any way. But, of Probably. course, I'm also aware that you know, the job is not going to go on further. And I'm just hoping that I'm going to make the right decision uh, when a decision needs to be made at some stage in the future. So at the moment, I'm just hoping that the season will start again, like so many others. I must say that the players at our club that I've spoken to are, you know, basically anxious to try and get back in whatever form we're allowed to get back. Um, and I join them and the staff join them in that, in that desire. But it's going to be unusual this end of season. Mm. Maybe the next season is going to be unusual. So... There's going to be a lot of new um, things to adapt to. Mm. So I've got a very open mind on the whole thing. But Great. at the moment, I'm just hoping for that day now that the government has relaxed its, its views and has basically given the green light as long as football can comply with all their guidelines to come back. I'm just hoping that we will be able to come back 
but a lot's got to be done yet. Yeah, Roy, so. uh, never an easy club for me to get to uh, from, from no, part of the world anybody. where I live. But I have to say, wonderful football club, fabulous supporters. Chairman's the top man. One more question, one more dancer. It's got to be one, one more dancer. One more dancer, Mr. Hodgson. Sasakaya and Monte Pelucciano. Sasakaya. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Class, but yes. It, from start it, to finish. <laughs> Class, Roy. Thank you very much Thanks, for taking Roy. time out to talk to us. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Guys. Brilliant, Thanks. Roy. Keep working, Top keep man. Going. Thank you very much. Uh, I love him to bits. I knew he would answer. Love him Sasakaya. to bits. Sasakaya. <laughs> yeah. You've got memories of going to Italy. Yes. To watch Glenn Hoddle's England Correct. play in Rome. Yeah. And we spent the evening. We went for a lovely plentiful dinner. Plentiful Sasakaya. And that was when his Italian was fluent. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tomorrow in our never-ending search. for to bring the best content that any broadcaster is at this time. We stray elsewhere for a fascinating mm. conversation with um, a group that aren't or haven't necessarily been thought too much about as we consider mm -hmm. playing football that. again. Not yeah? too many clues, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm. So thank you for your company again today. We're on air at these same times in uh, the BN Broadcast Network that you found us today, available on YouTube for our international audience. Mm -hmm. And stay safe, everyone. Whatever else you do, stay safe. <laughs>